Okay, I guess we should uh, we should be starting. Um, so my name is Remy, and I will later introduce uh, the two other speakers uh, here today. So the goal of our presentation, I have a Q and A here. Uh, uh, okay, I'm gonna st I see the questions. All right, I will I will look into the questions a, a bit later. Um, the point of our workshop today is to introduce um, example use cases, the one that we have uh, advanced on our own and by also the cooperation with uh, either R&D department of a company or uh, a research lab. So the point is to understand how PIM can be used in a practical use case and how uh, the programming of those use cases have been uh, completed and to also maybe uh, remove some figures that maybe such an, uh, an accelerator will have uh, complex or difficult uh, coding uh, to, to, to take care of. And we want to give you this broad picture also in an algorithm uh, sense so that you understand uh, how those problems have been solved and follow the architecture's benefits uh, to get the best results. So let's go to the next slide. Today, uh, we have Romaric. Uh, he's a software engineer, SDK specialist uh, at TopMem. He will expose the entire architecture of the accelerator. He will uh, show you also his work on genomics. Julien, who joined us recently, is a field application engineer, and he has investigated the index search uh, part of our use case. And myself, Remy, I will be here for the first slides and the last ones, uh, so to wrap everything up and also uh, address every questions regarding uh, partnerships, if there are any. So today, we should wrap this up in about two hours, I hope. Uh, let's see how it goes. Uh, I don't think it would last the three hours that it was uh, uh, put on in the, in the website. Uh, the idea is that I quickly explain what is up mem and what we do, and then Romaric will go on into the, the first use case, and Julien will also expose the second use case, and all of that with a bit of Q&A, hopefully fits in two hours. So, who are we? Up mem is, as you understood, uh, making a processing and memory uh, product. It's, uh, to this day, the first one that has reached, uh, I would say, a production uh, stage. Uh, we are based in Grenoble. We are not uh, ourselves producing uh, the, the, the DRAM. We are a fabless uh, company. Uh, in this sense, we are already capable and already delivering to uh, clients all around the world. It could be companies, it could also be labs and research centers. Um, we also have the opportunity to use our technology through a data center, which is already in place for quite a lot of uh, academics at this point. Um, and of course, we are backed up by a lot of investors, uh, such as Western Digitals uh, and so on. So let's go into, okay, processing in memory, just for, the, for those that uh, wouldn't know what's the main idea behind it. Basically, at least in the upmem design, we have equipped our memory with thousands of cores, processing cores, small ones, but they are many. Uh, and doing this, we kept the DDR standard design so that, in fact, the product looks like exactly your typical DRAM, only that it would be a PIM. Uh, DRAM, and in this sense, it's compatible with the current architectures of servers. Um, and this is a main point of uh, our work, is to maintain the ability to be compatible with uh, servers that are already, of course, deployed. And the other benefits to be fitting into the DRAM uh, manufacturing process is that we also benefit from the cost reduction uh, effect of this industry that is obviously uh, very tuned and very, uh, I would say, optimized in terms of cost 
uh, of production. So in that sense, it will also impact the way that we we can commercialize a product that is basically uh, nowhere near the range of GPUs or FPGA. And as a whole, I would say that PIM, obviously its first, uh, I would say, um, benefit would be that as you understand, the data is processed within the memory. This allows that you don't have transfers of data constantly between CPU and memory, because now your memory is capable of running uh, calculation. This has, of course, quite some impacts in terms of energy consumption, because they are at the source, uh, th those transfers are the source of what costs energy in a server. And on the other side, it also, in purely in terms of uh, performance, allows you to alleviate any sort of uh, bottlenecks that you will have, memory bottlenecks, uh, allowing you to basically make use of these mini cores and offloading the CPU of the work that now he doesn't have to do. So as a whole, what we experienced so far is that, and you will see in the use case, we have acceleration uh, that goes in the range from 10 to 20. And usually it also goes with energy reduction in the range of depending on use cases from seven to 12 uh, and TCO reduction also will be impacted by sometimes a factor from six to 15, depending also if you compare to uh, the more advanced or expensive accelerator. So that's it for me. I will now give the hand to Romaric so that he explained a little bit more about the architecture. Good morning, everyone. Um, so let's go. Um, so what we are doing here at MEN is trying to free the data bus, um, which means that uh, we start from applications that are mostly uh, data intensive. And um, as we've added some DPU, which is the name of our processor inside the DRAM chip, we are now capable of uh, performing computation inside the memory chip, which frees some uh, data movement between the CPU and the DRAM. So it's both to uh, compute faster as well as being uh, um, uh, consume, consuming less uh, energy, because as we are not moving the data between the DRAM and CPU, it consumes less energy, and we are trying to get a bigger bandwidth, so it enables us to have uh, better performances. So uh, let's have a look at a DRAM chip. That's kind of a standard DRAM chip with its DDR interface and eight uh, memory banks of 64 megabytes. And what we've done it's, is that we've added all those, all those blocks in yellow. So we've got one DPU per memory bank and one control interface. So as you can see, the control interface is memory map as the memory banks are. So to um, communicate with it, it's just a question of uh, reading and writing at uh, the proper address space uh, with the CPU. And the DPU, they are not memory mapped, so you cannot communicate with them directly through the DDR interface. Uh, the only communication that is possible is through the control interface. So we are able to send commands to the control interface so that it sends uh, uh, commands to the DPU. And each DPU can access its uh, 64 megabyte memory bank, and that's it. It cannot see other DPUs, it cannot see other memory banks, so it's really narrow in that sense. Um, and so that's what we've uh, added in the, the DRAM chip. Um, now I want to take a look closer at what's inside uh, one DPU. So, of course, the, the, the bigger thing in reality is the memory bank, which we call the MRAM. But uh, for the, the sake of un understanding, it's a bit uh, smaller there. And so you get your DPU, which is composed of many memories, a DM engine and a pipeline. So we got a memory, the IRAM for the instruction. We've got a working memory, the WRAM of 64 kilobyte, um, which is like 
which will be used like a, a, some kind of scratch pad or a cache for the MRAM. We've got the registers, which is kind of a memory uh, in, in a sense, and the pipeline. So the pipeline, it's uh, the, the heart of the DPU. Uh, that's where the instruction will be computed. And so it will read the instruction from the, from the IRAM. It will use the WRAM in load and store to, to, to have some uh, space to store data and, and things like that. And it will be able to control the DM engine. So the DM engine is there to allow uh, the application to move data from and to the MRAM, from to the WRAM. It can also move data from the MRAM to the IRAM, not uh, the opposite. And um, one major point there is that we have also uh, a multiplexer in front of the MRAM which is needed there because of the DDR4, uh, because of the DDR4. So it means that either the host application or the DPU will be able to access the MRAM at point, but not both at, it at the same time. Um, so that's quite a, a big constraint in terms of programming, but we will see how we deal with that. It's um, mostly you won't see it, you won't program the mix yourself, but it has some other constraints in the, in the API so that uh, everything goes, uh, goes well. Um, a few things about the pipeline. So uh, the pipeline is composed of uh, 24 threads that are, um, that are interleaved. So it means that the pipeline is executing one instruction every cycle at best. And uh, the, the, the threads are just interleaved, so they are, they are mixed in the pipeline uh, to, to get the, the best performances. I will go through that again during the programming uh, demonstration. Um, last thing I want to mention about the architecture is that at the end, you've got a PIM module composed of uh, eight chip in one rank. So of course, you can have module with double rank which means you've got a chip on each uh, face of the, the module. And when the CPU performs a memory transfer, it will transfer uh, as the usual eight, eight bytes. And you need to be aware of that, that those bytes will be uh, spread in different DPU. I mean, kind of the same DPU of different chip. So um, it means that when we are performing transfer between the CPU and the, the memory, we need to be aware of it because that means a lot in terms of performances. So we always try to target multiple DPU at a time when performing transfer to be as efficient as possible. Otherwise, we will just uh, not use all the bandwidth that is available between the CPU and the DPU. Okay, um, that's it for the architecture. Maybe um, if people have some questions, I can answer them right now about the architecture before going through to the programming part. So I'm not too sure how it works for the questions, but yeah, if there are any questions and you want to come forward, don't hesitate. Uh, you can also ask questions at the end of Romaric uh, presentation. Sure. Well, um, ah, we have a question. Yeah. Um, so yes, the DPU is on the, in the DRAM die. So it's it's why it's uh, such a, a challenge to integrate it uh, as it because on the DRAM die you do not have that many layers of metal. So it's pretty hard to implement a processor there. And um, it, it means that there are a lot of constraints to build the DPU that you will see uh, during the programming, uh, mostly about the pipeline. Um, so I will talk about that uh, a bit after. There's a question from Marek also in the, in the Q&A session. Someone is asking, may you comment on coherency? Yeah. Um, so, for the currency part, 
it's um, quite easy. Nothing will be done for you at that point. It means that you will manage the currency yourself. When you want data to be moved to the, the DPU, you will ask explicitly to transfer the data. And, and that's how it works at the moment. Um, Yes, and um, the other question, yeah, the, the data placement is very important and uh, that's a big part of how to, 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 to architecture the application, to know what data will be where and to understand on what data each GPU will be working. That's very important as well. Okay. Um, I will continue with the programming part, will be in, will, which will answer uh, most of the question, I, I believe. Um, so that's for the toolchain. So we are based on the LLVM infrastructure. So we are using uh, Clang and LLDB to compile and debug the DPU. Um, we also have uh, um, a communication library to manage the DPU uh, and also a simulator uh, so that you can uh, use the toolchain with the, without any uh, real hardware. So uh, about that, uh, I can say that if you go to the website uh, sdk.appmem.com, you will be able to download the SDK with the simulator. And if you want to play with it, it's uh, totally free. So feel free to to go there and download the, the latest uh, release uh, to play with it. Um, okay, so the, the demo that I will uh, show you uh, right now is the one performing a very simple checksum on some data. So uh, we will work on a system where we have uh, a lot of DPUs and so we will have our CPUs and some legacy DRAM. So we will have our input data in the legacy DRAM. We will need to send it to the uh, DPUs. The DPUs will compute the checksum and then we will get back the result in the legacy DRAM to have it in available directly from the CPU to, to check it and to print it. Um, we have a very similar code uh, on the GitHub if you want to, to go there to to have a look after the presentation. On the DPU side, there are also things that you need to understand is that the input data will be first in the MRAM. At some point, we need to have it in the WRAM to have it available to the DPU pipeline. And the pipeline will compute the checksum uh, in the WRAM. After that, we'll see what we will do with it. Okay. So let me make go through the code. So I've prepared a few things there uh, to be a bit quicker. So let me open a simple code for the DPU part. So we'll have two, two codes, one for the DPU, one for the host. Um, for the beginning, we will uh, just look at the DPU and then we'll look at what we can do with the host part. So that's a, a very simple C code. So I can have like something like a null word there with the DPU. Uh, of course, I will need to include the proper header there. And so uh, I'm able to compile it with uh, Clang. So that's just a little wrapper around Clang to have the, the uh, good option to compile for the DPU. And so, like that, I can compute my code for the DPU. And uh, I can now use LLDB, again, with a uh, wrapper to uh, run this little code. And as you can see, I've got my uh, printf there. So I'm using LLDB as a runner that, there, more than a debugger. But of course, we will be able to debug with uh, LLDB. Um, okay, that's a very simple example. So let's switch to something a bit more complex. Um, so what we want is to have uh, uh, an area in the MRAM to store the data from the checksum. So for that, we need uh, a buffer. 
So let's have uh, a buffer there of uh, some uh, some elements. If I'm writing it like that, the buffer will be in WRAM. In fact, everything I'm writing right now will be stored more, more or less in the WRAM. And if I want this buffer to be in the MRAM, I need to specify it using this attribute, um, um, which will allow me to have the buffer in MRAM. Um, and now I just want to compute the checksum. And to do that, it's quite easy. Uh, I will have just a checksum uh, variable there, and I can have a loop. like that to uh, do my checksum. And at the end, I can print the result of the checksum, something like that. So if I'm compiling it again and running it with LDB, I will get the results. Of course, I did not initialize the MRAM, so it might be initialized with O0 um, because of some previous execution on DDPU, whatever. So I can also have something maybe a bit smaller. So uh, let's have something a bit cleaner. Like that, and we can have the initialization of the MRAM like that. So at the end, um, we will expect to have something like uh, 10, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, looks like 10. So combine, combining it again, and we have uh, our checks in there. So that's that's pretty good. Um, of course, when we are doing that, we are doing it to be uh, as efficient as possible. So we will need to have some indicator to measure our performance. So in the DPU, we have some um, counter. <coughs> we allow, allow us to count the cycle. So that's what I'm going to use right now. And so um, I'm going to initialize the buff counter right there. With, uh, we have a few functions to initialize the buff counter. Um, so we have this one. Uh, yeah, we've got the buff counter config right there and buff counter get there to get the value of the graph counter. So first thing I, I want to do is use the graph counter config function to choose what I'm going to count, because I can count cycle or instruction. And right now, I don't want to count cycle, because that's uh, what will show us the, def the global performances. Sorry. So let's go back there, and let's count cycle. And I want to reset the counter at the beginning uh, so that it starts from zero. And um, at the end, I can have the, the number of cycles used to compute the this checksum. Um, and I can print it right there. Uh, so right. Right there, I will be able to know how many in, uh, how many cycle I've used to compute uh, our execution, uh, and so told me that I, I'm using uh, 500 cycle to compute these four elements. So that's quite a lot for uh, such a few elements, and there are many reasons for that. Um, first of all. Uh, I'm accessing this MRAM buffer through uh, like a simple access. So that's something the, the compiler can do, but it will do it like not very efficiently because it's like uh, an implicit access to the MRAM. 
So we will want to have some explicit access of the MRAM to be more uh, efficient. And as well, right now I'm using only uh, one thread. And uh, because of all the, the DPU being in the DRAM die, one thread cannot execute more than one instruction every uh, 11 cycles. So that's not very efficient. And um, to be able to execute more instruction per cycle, what we want is to have at least uh, 11 thread uh, working at the same time. So I'm going to do both things. First, I'm going to uh, have more, more thread um, working in parallel. So, um, so uh, for that, um, I will just uh, add a few things to be able to use multiple thread. So first, um, there is a, a me function uh, defined in uh, header of DPU to get the ID of the thread that is running. So if it's the thread zero, I will do the initialization of, uh, of the perf counter config. And um, at the end, it will be only, again, the thread zero that will do the, the end, uh, end part of the application. Um, I will be able to synchronize all my threads using a barrier there. Um, so I'm going to have barriers, and you, there will be a number of tasks left there, um, like that. Uh, and so right now, I'm able to just wait on this barrier to synchronize all the threads to make sure that no one starts before the performer config has been executed. And the same at the end. Um, okay, um, so each thread will compute uh, a part of the, of the buffer, and at the end we will have only one thread just uh, doing the, the, the merge of everything. So I will, I will have uh, a small buffer in WRAM, they are accessible to everyone. Uh, like that. To be able to have everything as we want. Uh, and at the end, what I can do is just have everything in one variable to have only one checksum at the end. As I said, uh, I want um, each task head to, to work on a part of the buffer. So there I will start with something like that. Uh, and uh, something like Now I need to, need to choose how many elements I've got per task left. So that will just be the size of the buffer divided by the number of task lets. So let's have uh, a bit more element there, maybe a bit more like a, a 1K element. Um, I won't initialize it right now because that's just too many. So that's okay for the, the code. Um, let me just compile it. Uh, so now that I want to compile it, I need to compile it and uh, ask the compiler to initialize more thread for me. So for that, just the question of initializing this uh, macro there and a tasklet that I'm using as well in, in the code. So like that, I can use 16 tasklets. And um, I can run again 
my program using EPL and DB. And uh, I've got something that should be uh, a bit more efficient. Um, so if we can have something to tell us that, that would be better. So let's have uh, something like that. Uh, we can like divide the, the time for uh, the buffer size to have an idea of um, how many uh, cycles per byte we are using. Um, something like that. Yeah. Okay, so there we have uh, 44 cycle uh, per byte. Uh, and before that, we were at uh, a bit more, I believe, because it was uh, four, four elements there. It's not bytes, it's more elements. So it, it was like, Hundred uh, more than hundred cycle per uh, elements. So that's quite a lot, and there it's it's uh, like more than two times less. So it's getting better, but still, uh, as I mentioned before, the access to the MRAM is not very efficient. So that's what I'm gonna work on it right now. So um, there. We are doing an implicit access, and I'm going to do some uh, explicit access. So for that, what I'm going to do is copy the data from the uh, from the MRAM to the WRAM. So I need somewhere in the WRAM to stock the data. So for that, I will have uh, a cache. I need uh, one cache per tasklet, and let's have a cache of, of cache size. Let's say. So I need a cache size, let's say, of uh, 32 elements. Um, and it will need to be DMI line because all the access that I'm going to do through the DMI need to be well aligned uh, to be performed uh, as efficiently as possible. Um, and so, so that's for this part. And um, now I'm going to, instead of doing elements per elements, I'm going to go through uh, one block per one block. So right there, I will uh, go through the cache. And I'm going to uh, use a function which is called MRAM read to read uh, the, the MRAM. Um, so what I'm going to read is uh, my buffer. And I'm going to read it from there. And I'm going to store it in my cache. Uh, something like that. And the number of, I need to mention how many elements I want to copy. So it would be just like that, the cache size. And when I have that, I can compute the checksum. So I've got, uh, in, a, in some header there, I've got a simple uh, checksum function that we use in both the DPU and CPU code. So I'm going to use it right now. Um, so I've got just my uh, checksum that would be And the number of elements is just cache size, like that. So there, um, for, for each tasklet, which are working on super, separate parts of the MRAM, I'm reading uh, the batch of uh, the cache size, the MRAM to copy it in the WRAM there, in the cache uh, variable. And when, once I have that, I'm be, I will be able to compute the checksum of this little part of the WRAM. And um, we'll do it uh, many times. So uh, maybe I need more elements because I've got 16 task and 32, uh, a cache of 32 elements. So let's have a bit more uh, elements there uh, to make sure that that's enough for our experiment. And so I will compile it again and run it again. Okay, and that feel uh, much better because to there to compute uh, 
to, to compute one element, it takes us four cycles. So that's uh, quite uh, less than before. And there we are very efficient to, to do our processing. So that, that's quite, uh, quite good for us. Or Mike, I don't know if other people have the same problem as me, but the bar you know of Zoom is hiding the last line of your results. Oh, okay. Uh, you can so press enter a few times so that. Uh, yeah, I, I will. I will deal with that. Uh, like that should be. Can yes. you see uh, which time the last? Yeah. So, okay. If it's good now, I will continue with that. So as you can see there. Before uh, we were at 44 uh, cycle per element, and now we are at four cycle per element. So that's quite better. Um, so that would be all for the DPU code. I will uh, show you once again the DPU code there. Um, so we've got a barrier that we, we need to synchronize the, the thread. We've got a buffer in MRAM with the data that are not initialized at the moment, but we'll do that in the host part. Um, we have some uh, variable to have the checksum of each uh, thread, and we, we are joining them at the end. Um, and we have a cache in WRAM to perform the transfer as efficiently as possible. Okay, um, so let's go now to the host part. First of all, I just want to modify a little bit the make file I'm gonna use because I didn't use the tasklet there. So I need to add that here. And I can switch to the host part. So uh, I've write quite some code before just to be uh, more efficient there. So I've got uh, some function to uh, allocate some buffer in the, uh, in the host CPU. So I will have an input array with the input data. I will have an output array with uh, the checksum of each DPU. And I will be able to initialize the array with some random values and to free the buffer at the end. And so that's my main function. So I will need to allocate some DPUs and then to allocate the buffer that I will use, uh, which is the function I've just show you. I will copy the input to the DPU, run the DPU, get the result, and then I will check that what has, what has been computed by the DPU corresponds to what the x86 is capable of computing uh, by itself to make sure that we've done the computation properly. So um, allocating the DPU. So that's uh, pretty easy. So we've got a DPU alloc function, which takes a, a number of DPU to allocate. So let's say I'm going to want one DPU. Then we've got a profile uh, argument that can be set to null because we don't want to do anything uh, special there. And uh, we need to give it uh, a sprint DPU set there to uh, store what we are allocating. And this function returns an error code. So to be uh, to make sure that there is no error, we have a macro there, DPU assert, to make sure that we are not missing anything um, from the, the return status of the function. So I'm going to use this macro quite a lot for each function. Um, so there we have allocated one DPU. Now what we want to do is to uh, load the DPU with the proper uh, program. So in our set, I want to um, put my binary uh, that I've put in the make file. So it's just a pass to the DPU uh, binary. And it returns something that we don't care about right now. Um, and what I will need for the other part of the application is to know how many DPUs I've allocated. So there it's quite easy because I'm, I'm just asking for one DPU. So I expect to have one DPU like that. But uh, to do that more, um, more cleanly, uh, I will use a function to make sure to have the, the right number of DPUs. So I can ask how many DPU I have in my DPU set. And this function will return me the, the right number. Uh, that will be useful uh, after. And so at the end, I will need to 
free the DPU, so that's just a call to DPU free, and that's quite uh, easy. So that's for the initialization, initialization of the DPUs and um, to free the DPU. Um, now I'm happy, I've got a DPU set of one DPU and I'm able to uh, copy some buffer in this uh, DPU set. So to do that, again, I'm gonna use DPU set to make sure I'm not uh, missing any errors returned from the API. And I just I can just uh, copy to the DPU set. So uh, uh, DPU, uh, I'm not sure, um, I don't remember what I want to do there. Um, so I'm going to use DPU, oh yeah, DPU copy two. So I'm going to copy to this DPU set. And then I'm going to uh, mention where I want to copy this data. So uh, what I need there is to say I want to copy to this variable buffer. So I just need to put the name of the variable there. Um, and after that, I can ask for an offset in this variable. If I want to access only a specific element is in buffer, I can use an offset there to access just this element. I will specify uh, my source, so the buffer in the um, in the x86. So that's my input array, and how many uh, the size of this copy. So uh, that's just size of, and uh, the number of elements. So right there, it's um, it's an inner element per DPU uh, times the number of DPU that I will have. Uh, no, it's just just the number of DPU because that's the side of the transfer per DPU. So that's just what I want. And in my uh, DPU code, I need to use the same uh, an element per DPU instead of this preferred size variable. So I'm just gonna change that. Okay. And that should be much better like that. Um, so that will copy the buffer that I've got in the host to uh, my little DPU that I've allocated there. Now I can ask the DPU to run. So that's with the DPU launch function. Uh, I will run it synchronously uh, to make sure that when this function finished, the execution will be complete. And uh, I'm going to get the result. So um, I'm going to copy from the this DPU set. And I need to copy something from the DPU code. And there, my uh, end checksum is right there. So that's a variable in the stack. So it's not accessible directly like that. So I will have the checksum somewhere else, like here. And to make it available, I will use this attribute uh, and I will call it checksum like that. And so this variable there will be in the WRAM, but because it has the attribute host, it will be available directly there. So I will ask for it. Um, I will need to tell where I want this variable to be stored in the host, so that my output array and the size of this transfer will be uh, the size of this element times the number of DPU. Uh, no, again, not not the size of the number of DPU like that. And so, if I've done everything properly. It should be okay right there. Uh, so we're gonna try that. Um, so let's compile it with the make file. Um, okay, I've got two definitions there. That's not good. So let me get rid of one, this one. Okay, that feels good. And now I can just, okay, that's, that's my whole, that's my mistake, um, which is right there. 
So, um, so okay, uh, let me talk about that a little bit. So there I've got a set of one DPU, but um, this DPU could be from, as I'm giving only one, uh, one destination, it cannot copy from a set. It needs to copy from a single DPU, uh, but right now this is not uh, exactly one DPU. It's, it's a set and in the set there is only one DPU. But to have only one DPU, we got like uh, an easy macro to iterate through the DPU of the set. So we can iterate like that uh, to, uh, on all the DPU of my set. So there it will be only one DPU, but that will do the job we want. And so uh, we should be able now there. So it recompiled the OS program and ran it. And so that's what we expect. So that's the checksum compute by the host, and that's the checksum compute by the DPU. That, that's what we, we wanted. Um, so we are quite happy with that. Um, as you can see, we don't see any printf of the DPU, and that's normal because uh, when you have a lot of DPUs, uh, if we were to print by default everything, it would be a bit too much. But if you really want, we can we can print the what's being print by the DPU. So for that, we have this function. Uh, um, which I don't remember right now. Uh, yeah, that's this one. So we can ask this function to print on std out the content that has been uh, printed by the DPU. So if I'm running it again, there uh, we can see what we what we have. Um, we can see that uh, okay. So the checksum is not in the proper format there. But that's not the most important part. Uh, we are not at the same performances as before. That just might be uh, because of the size the number of elements, which not, might not be enough. Uh, before, we are at something like that. So let's run it again. It didn't recompile because that's the error. And uh, there we have something like Something that does not feel right. Uh, did I do something wrong there? Um, the DPU, yes, that feels right. That's initialized. Okay. Uh, let me run it once more. Okay. So that might just be the parentheses in the macro that we're missing. And we have what we are expecting. We can maybe just have the DPU printing the value in the same format so that we understand everything. And that is much better. Okay, so there we are happy. Um, We've compute with one DPU, but uh, most of the time you won't try to compute with the one DPU because it's just not enough and it's not what what we want to do. So what we want there is to use many DPUs. So there I'm going to use the DPU allocate all to use all the DPU available on the system. So I can also add a printf there to say how many DPUs have allocated. Like that, um, and that would be uh, almost it. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have uh, many um, many reviews there, one per DPU. So uh, here I will need to get all the results one by one, like that. So I'm just gonna store it in different area in the output array. Um, and uh, and that should be okay right there. Um, okay, so let's have maybe not all the DPU. Just let's just have two DPU for the beginning. 
Okay, so there we've got two DPUs allocated. So we have the printf of the two DPUs that compute the same thing because we've sent it the same data. And at the end, the x86 uh, is not happy because uh, it's looking at it as uh, if the DPUs were uh, computing uh, one part of the, um, the computation and the it, it, x86 is trying to, to merge it together to see if it's, uh, if it's correct. So that's not what I, I was expecting when I wrote the host part. So let's try to have something that match what uh, the verification does. So to do that, I will uh, want each DPU to have a different part, um, a different part of the input array. Um, okay, uh, so there I will want to send a different uh, element to each DPU. So for that, I can do something like that. So to each DPU, I'm going to send specific part of the input buffer. Um, I will run all the DPU and then I'm getting the result from the two DPUs and at the end it will compute the checksum merge for the DPU and the real checksum detecting one from the input array directly, uh, which is what we are what, what we are expecting. So if I'm running this code right now, it's better. So uh, the DPU did not compute the same value because it didn't have the same uh, input array. But at the end, when it, uh, it's merged by the x86, we got the proper value that we were expecting. So that's very good. Um, now what we can, uh, okay, now I'm gonna show you something else. Um, so when I'm running this checksum host, um, I can profiling to see what's happening there. So I've got this uh, profiling uh, tools in the, in the SDK. Um, and so I'm going to use it. I'm not going to talk too much about it. You will see the result after I've running it. It would be more interesting like that. Okay. So. Um, okay, and uh, let's see what is what it's done right there. Okay, so there I've got uh, a timeline of what has been executed, um, and I can zoom a bit on the interesting part. So I've got the allocation and the load at the beginning, and now I've got. Uh, my copy two to one DPU, another copy two to another DPU, the launch on the two DPUs. And after that, uh, I've got many things. So I've got some uh, some copy from to get the uh, output value. And I've got some copy from MRAM to get the printf, something like that. So there, there's a lot of things, but um, what it is interesting is that the copy is sequential, so it's not very efficient. Um, we could have them uh, like in parallel, which would be more efficient. So that's what we are going to, to do right now. Um, so let's have, instead of iterating through the DPU and copy it uh, one, one, uh, one DPU by one DPU, we will try to do uh, one access uh, only to copy both array to uh, the DPUs. So uh, to do that, we have something uh, in, the, in the host library. So we can prepare a transfer and we say, so this DPU will get uh, this buffer. So we are just specifying which DPU is will be uh, connected to which buffer. And at the end, uh, we will perform the transfer so that this function uh, DPU push transfer, and we are mentioning the buffer on the uh, DPU side, the offset and the size of the DPU. And we need also to mention uh, the, the, in, uh, how the transfer will be done, either to the DPU or from the DPU. 
So that would be a transfer to the DPU, and uh, it would be V4 transfer. Uh, I will talk to that. Uh, I have to talk to about that after. And we'll do the same thing for the copy from. Um, so again, we need to prepare the transfer like that. Uh, and we'll be copying from. And that's just one element that we need to copy. Okay, so if we do that not right now, okay, so we don't have the print, the computation is still okay. Uh, so let me compile it again. Um, let's have something else there. And so now we can have a look at what we've computed, which is a bit more efficient because we only see there only the, so the push extra function and we see only one copy because it does the TPU at in one time. So if I'm looking at how many times it took to do that, like it's okay, 100 milliseconds. And if we look at the previous one again, it would it was uh, much more because if we look at just all that, uh, it feels like okay, yeah, yeah. So before it was hundred. Uh, no, what did I miss? That's four hundred microseconds, and before that. Did I misread something? Yeah, it was uh, 100 microseconds. So there it's like more than four times uh, faster with uh, the two DPUs in parallel. And it's even more like that if you have a lot of DPUs. There is only two DPUs, but now we're going to switch to uh, much more DPU. And so that's very important to have those transfer doing like that in one batch because it allows us to use all the bandwidth that is available between the CPU and the DPU. So um, uh, the last thing we want to do there is to say, okay, now I, I don't want two DPU. I want all the DPU available on the system. Um, so I can do something like that. So there I've got uh, 640 DPUs allocated. And uh, if I'm running it with this, um, with this profiling tool again. So once again, it's on the two. Okay, let me load it once again. Okay, so um, we've got one line per rank, so per group of 64 DPU. And we can see that uh, the, the copy are, are done in parallel, so that's very efficient to copy to the, the 60, 600 uh, DPU. So it took like, okay, uh, one, uh, one, 1 1.5 milliseconds, but it's like uh, the three, 300 times more than more DPU than we had before. So that's quite uh, more efficient than what we have before. And the same for the retrieving of the result, uh, which, are, which is far more efficient there. Um, okay, and so last thing I want to talk about is um, that's good. We 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 did one thing on the DPU, but uh, in most use cases we will want to do uh, many things. I mean, many iteration of quite the same thing. So right there, I'm gonna just add a loop um, to do two times this computation. It would be exactly the same computation, but it doesn't matter for the purpose of what I want to show you guys. Um, okay, that, that's okay. So uh, now I'm going to compile it again and run it with this profiling tool.
Um, not sure what the result is not okay right there. Maybe I've done something wrong with the duration, but it doesn't matter right now. Just let's just to get a look at what we, we have right there. So we've got uh, two times uh, what we are wanted. So we've got this part there, which is the first iteration, and this part there, which is the second iteration. Um, as you can see, we've got a lot of blank in for each rank between each operation. So that means it's not very efficient because each rank is waiting a lot there. It's waiting between the copy and the start of the execution. So it's quite a lot of time where we are doing nothing and that's not good. And so to allow you to uh, have something as efficient as possible, we have some um, asynchronous execution between all the ranks so that no ranks is waiting on the other one to do the, the, the either the transfer or the, the computation. And so for that, we just have some uh, flag there that we can change to have some asynchronous execution. Um, and so if I'm running it like that now, not good and something went wrong uh, okay what's what's the reason uh, that's the demo effect I'm just gonna check if my system is okay I'm gonna try to run it once again to make sure that's okay something Something is not okay right there. Uh, did I do something wrong? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, because I've executed everything asynchronously, at some point I need to wait for everything to finish. So I'm missing this uh, synchronization at the end to say, okay, no. Before verifying the computation, I want to wait for everything to be to to have been done properly. So uh, let's add it like that, and it should be much better, I believe. Okay, so that would be okay for uh, our purpose there. And so if we look now at the computation, as you can see, it's much more efficient. So all those functions, push expert, dp launch, uh, are done at some point, but they are just on queue job in uh, in the FIFO, and all the ranks are performing all the operation as fast as possible. And at the end, of course, they are not finishing at the same time because there are uh, copies that are that has been done uh, before some other. Because on the x86, we don't have enough resources to copy uh, to all the DPU at uh, at the same time, so. There are ranks that are being copied to before some other ranks, but that's not the, the point. The point is that it took less, less time than before, and that's much more efficient. So if we are doing like uh, 100 uh, iteration of this uh, computation, it will be much more efficient, and that's what we were targeting there. Okay, uh, that will be all for the programming demonstration. So again, maybe I can take a uh, some question if there are. Yeah, there are questions waiting for you. Oh yeah, okay. So let me let me read them. Um, okay, that's the question before. Uh, so we have a question: What are the benefits of using MRAM in the DPU energy? Um, I'm not sure about this question. So the MRAM it's just the the name we gave to the the DRAM memory of the DRAM chip. So that's the standard memory of the, the DRAM. And uh, that's the only uh, memory that is available so that the, the host and the DPU can target. So we need to go through it. Um, so that's what I can say about this one. Um, Yeah, no, it's not a, a magnetic, magnetic RAM at all. It's just uh, the main memory, uh, as we call it. 
Um, so is the DPU reside on the same time as the RAM? Okay, so that's a question that we've answered before. So the same die, uh, the DPU is on the same light, same die as the GRAM. Um, okay. So the, the performance estimate execution time is based on hardware simulation. So right now I was executing things on the real hardware. So that was not like a simulation, it's just uh, running on some real hardware that we have in our data center. But of course, if you're downloading the SDK and you don't have access to this hardware, you can use our simulator. Uh, so it's a functional simulator, which means that the the performance number that will give that it will giving that will that it will be giving you are not uh, very accurate. Um, so it's quite tricky there to to get a, a sense of how uh, fast it is with the simulator. The best way to to benchmark the application is to use the real hardware. And for with the simulator, you can have uh, up to sixty four. Uh, DPUs, that's, so that's not that much. So it's always better to, to use the real hardware for that. Um, OK, and for the performance counter, the only thing that we have is one counter that is counting either the cycle or the instruction. And so uh, if you want to uh, count the number of memory accessed or the bandwidth, you will need to uh, add some code in the DPU yourself to measure how many transfers you've done and things like that. So it's possible. We've done it for many use cases. But at the moment, we do not have some hardware support to make it uh, easier for you. Uh, that, will, that might be something we are targeting for uh, the next version. Um, OK, a question about the energy. Um, so. It's quite hard uh, right now to really measure uh, precisely the energy. Um, but what we uh, did is in, a, in, a, in not a, an application setup, we can measure the consum consumption of one DM individually. So that's what we've done to have a proper understanding of uh, how much energy it consumes. Um, and as well, we have something that is not quite yet in the SDK to try to use the counter that are available in the x86 to measure the consumption of the memory channel. But it's uh, at a too, too big a grain for us because it's, uh, it's giving us the consumption of uh, the whole memory controller. So it's, it means that it both uh, the the channels with DPUs, uh, so with uh, upmem uh, DRAM and the legacy DRAM. So it's both at the same time, so it's, that's not very easy to use. Um, OK, what is the default destination of the DPU, the copy 2? OK. OK, so uh, DPU copy 2 or copy from or even the push expert you need to specify um, a variable in the DPU side. So that's how the, the default destination is chosen. It means that if the variable of the DPU is in the MRAM, it will be copied to the MRAM. If the variable is in the WRAM, it will be in the WRAM. Uh, as I've shown you uh, there in my uh, DPU code, I've got there the buffer variable, which is in MRAM. And I've got this checksum variable which, I've, which is in WRAM, but I've made it available to the host with this uh, um, attribute there. Otherwise, all the other variable, like the cache, is not available to the, the host. Um, OK, I think that's, that's all for the, the question I have there. Yes, from Mike, I would say that uh... It was uh, it was quite dense. Maybe we can take the the break now. Yeah, yeah, sure. Just, just a five minute break so that everyone can uh, get a drink and uh, rest his brain after after all of this uh, important uh, but dense information. Yep. Let's have uh, five minute breaks. 
So guys, let's go back at around 10.45, uh, of course, um, France time or your uh, Belgium time, sorry. Uh, and, and then we resume with the use case presentation. Right, yes. Uh, and then the, the memory control is just looping, but uh, well, yes, it's performing transfer per, per batch of eight bytes. And so as I've mentioned before, the tricky part is that those bytes are sent to different DPUs because when you are using standard uh, DRAM chip, uh, you want all the DRAM chip to be used and not uh, being like accessing only one chip because it's you will have a smaller bandwidth and it will uh, it will um, make this chip being used more than the other, so it it might break before the other one. So that's not what you want. So you want all the chip to be used uh, as a, as a much as the other. So that's why that's why it's implementing like it's implemented like that with the x86 and the standard DRAM, and we need to right now we need to deal with that. So that's uh, all the point of the SDK right now. Um, okay, so for the checksum uh, on the system I'm working there, we have like uh, 600 DPUs, so it means uh, about uh, four, uh, 40 gigabytes of memory in total. So we can have up to a checksum of up to 40, almost 40 gigabytes, yes, something like that. And that's based yeah. on the configuration you have yeah. there, but yeah. it can be more. Yeah, on, on some uh, new system that we are bringing up, we've got like uh, more than 2,000 DPUs. So that makes more than 100 gigabytes of memory. So that's uh, far more than uh, what we have uh, right now during this demonstration. OK, so let me um, continue with this first use case, UPVC. Uh, which stand for upmem variant coding. So that's a, um, a genomic uh, algorithm. So I'm going to talk a bit about it. But before that, uh, let's uh, just have a few, uh, an overview of the performances. So maybe Remy, you want to, to talk about it? Sure. Um, so today we. Um, we, we've run this um, this uh, algorithm, okay, that is uh, doing mapping and variant calling uh, on our, I would say, more up-to-date platform that we have uh, on 2,560 DPUs, uh, as you can see. So those times, if you're not in genomics, might not mean much to you, but just to know that when it's the same code uh, that will be put on CPU, it runs in uh, in about five hours. Uh, and, and the same in P runs in less than an hour and 50 minutes. Uh, it compares also to what FPGA uh, provider, what would say the most uh, well-known uh, solutions, for example, provided by Dragon um, from Illumina that is running on FPGA, which is, uh, I would say, a sort of a state of the art for running such a, such a workload. You also have NVIDIA with the Parabricks uh, solution that is also in segment uh, running genomics calculation. So this is what we compare ourselves to. By the way, this is uh, also on the paper that we published at the BIBM conference, and it's something that you can uh, find online, or you can contact us to to receive the the full paper uh, that was um, presented there. So today you see 51 minutes with all a current configuration. In the next uh, very uh, soon version that we may, we would have, I would say in February or, February or March, uh, because we should reach 450 megahertz with our DPUs. You see it will run in 39 minutes and essentially will uh, be a bit better than uh, the, the GPU version. Uh, and then it goes on like this. You see we have quite a program in what uh, the DPUs will uh, perform. You see it's this, this two side of it. There is the frequency and there's also the density, how many DPU we can fit in a server. And we are hopeful that around, uh, I would say, August, 
to be uh, even a bit better than that. We can have the latest uh, Intel platform like Ice Lake, uh, where you can fit uh, even more uh, DRAM. And of course, it will be PIM DRAM in OK. So it will increase the density to over 3,000 DPUs. So of course, that will also bring uh, the computation time much lower. Uh, and later on, we are also going to reach 600 megahertz uh, and even higher density uh, if we can uh, with these new um, platforms. And you see at the end of 2021, we should be even maybe reaching about 15 minutes. Uh, and to answer the question that was asked, uh, and it's, it's a good uh, example here, the scalability uh, is, quite, uh, is quite proven so far. Uh, of course, the more you increase the number of memory banks and DPUs, you might lose a little bit uh, in, I would say, orchestration time. Uh, but so far, it's been quite neglectable. Uh, and it's been, I would say, uh, going up almost linearly. Maybe Romai could uh, uh, say something about this if, if, if it's not true. Uh, but yeah, we, we experience that it's quite scalable. Uh, with a little nuance of orchestration time. And to, yeah, Romain, you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, I agree. There are uh, some small challenges uh, during the, the bring up of the application, but at the end, we managed to have it uh, scaling. So I would say it's, it's not like, um, it, sometimes you, you will need to adapt a little bit the, the host uh, application, but uh, that's just a question of uh, a few lines of code to make sure that uh, everything will scale uh, well. So it's it's not uh, an hardware restriction. It's more like uh, using properly all the software to make sure that uh, you won't uh, eat any bottleneck. Okay. And the, 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 the graph on the right side is exposing the, the cost overall, uh, as well as energy uh, estimations. Uh, and as you see, of course, when you look into GPU solutions or FPGA, they are obviously quite costly. Uh, in comparison, the uh, configuration with PIM uh, will be a much less, of course, in energy, but you see it's not most of the source of the, I would say, expenditures for such a solution. The hardware is, is, is uh, the main of it. And as you can see, because of the cost structure of uh, the PIM technology, we are able to provide much lower, um, I would say, cost per analysis um, for, for the genome. So this is important because in the future, I would say, uh, more popularized, more access to genomics as it's uh, scheduled to be, PIM can play a big part in making it, uh, I would say, accessible to a large amount of uh, potential patients. So this is this is important, I would say, particularly in this industry. Um, yeah, I think I think this is uh, all I wanted to say. Maybe one thing I would add, and Romaik, maybe you will add it too, but of course, this is an experimentation. There are still work to be done in terms of uh, increasing quality of the results and so on. So there's still work to be picked up from this, but it's, it's an example of how it can be run on PIM uh, efficiently. Uh, but of course, we, there are also more work to be done uh, to make it uh, state of the art. Yep. Okay, so um, let's talk a bit about UPVC. So what does it do? So that's uh, an algorithm uh, which, aim as, uh, which aim at uh, finding the differences between a reference and a human uh, genome. So we have uh, in, uh, in the internet, you can find a reference human genome. And uh, then after that, you need like a real uh, human genome that you get from a sequencer from someone. And the sequencer will not give you like the genome uh, in, uh, in one line uh, with uh, everything uh, well ordered. It will give you like some small, what we call reads. So some uh, part of the genome which are uh, from like 120 nucleotide to 150 nucleotide, something like that. So uh, the nucleotide, it's just one letter there. So there are only four letters possible. It's uh, G, T, C, and A. And so you've got like that from the sequencer, you've got uh, 
a lot of like millions of uh, of reads that you need to compare to a big sequence of a reference genome. So the reference genome is uh, three gigabyte. It's like a, a three giganucleotide. And so the the goal of UPVC is to find where there are meaningful differences, which would be like the color of the eyes or uh, whether or not you you are um, you are like uh, you have more chance to 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 get uh, to get all in, uh, in good uh, health or thing like that. Uh, so think for the 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 bioinformatician to 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 deal with there, but it's not uh, the our job there. We just want to to make this uh, software run as fast as possible. So. Um, UPVC is our software, and we are mostly comparing to GATK, which is the main software that is being uh, using uh, from now. And so the output is uh, saying with, in which chromosome there is a different, and at which position, and what is the the reference and the alteration. So the well, what what change between the 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 reference and the the genome. Uh, we can have uh, three types of things. We can have a substitution, like the, the last one. So there was an A and there is a G now. We can have uh, insertion and deletion. So we can have a bit more or a bit less uh, at some point. So uh, this algorithm is can, can be uh, separated into two parts. So there is a mapping part and a, a variant coding part. So in our case, the mapping part is performed on the DPU, and the line coding is performed on the x86. So the, the DPU is just uh, saying, OK, I'm going to have uh, a group of, uh, of um, reads, and I'm going to try to uh, have a look at where this read, this read map the, the best. And it will then give, give the result to the, to the host to perform some uh, heuristic to know uh, what to to keep, what to not to keep, and have some filters to have the end result. The question there is how can you have this uh, three gigabyte uh, reference fitting in all the DPU on or in one DPU? Because as mentioned, one DPU can access only sixty four megabytes of data. So this reference is too big to be uh, stored in each DPU. And so we need to, um, to balance it between all the DPU. So what we've done is we've hashed it with a sliding window. So uh, what I mean by that is we took a read. So there it's smaller than what I was mentioning just for the sake of this uh, presentation. And we we uh, we take the the, four, the, the first um, nucleotide of the reads as the, the key of this hash table. And so we got at the end a hash table there where we store only uh, the, the end of the read. And we have our window, which is sliding like that. So going from one nucleotide to another to have everything stored at the end in uh, this hash table. And it results in an hash table of about uh, 100 gigabytes, 120 gigabytes. And so with uh, about uh, 2,000 DPU, we are able to store this hash table in the DPUs. So it's uh, much more easy to, um, to, to spread this hash table between all the DPU because we can have only a part of the hash table uh, in each uh, DPU. Um, and on the DPU, so we are sending it many reads at the time, and it will take each read, each read one by one and apply uh, an algorithm composed of two main uh, functions. Uh, first one, no DP, which is uh, a fast filter, which, uh, which will give us uh, an idea of either there is something interesting or not, or maybe it can't say, and we need to apply another uh, function, which is ODPD, which is kind of a programming dynamic, uh, dynamic programming algorithm, which takes a lot of time, but which will give us uh, a more precise understanding of what is happening between the 
the read and the reference. Um, and so everything uh, is working in parallel with 16 uh, thread or taskhead. And we have a request area in the MRAM. And all the taskheads are sharing this area through uh, a structure in WRAM, uh, which is the, the request pool, which is protected with some mutexes to make sure that all the taskheads are not uh, computing the same thing. And so they are uh, going in this request area to get one input, then they compute the, the input, and at the end, they are storing the result they have in a, a, a common uh, result area protected again by a mutex. So that, that for the inside of the DPU. And um, from the host part, it's um, a bit uh, complicated. Uh, so there is a pipeline uh, to make sure that uh, the idea there is to make sure that the DPU is always working. So there is um, different stages in the pipeline. So we've got a state where we are only reading from the disk the inputs to have it in another uh, data structure. Then we are dispatching the data structure among the DPU because each thread we won't go in every DPU. It will only go to a DPU where there is something meaningful to compute because the DPU is storing only one part of the hash table. And then the results are accumulated uh, in the host part before being processed uh, again on the host part. So it's quite a, a complex um, pipeline there. Um, but the, the, the whole uh, goal there is to have the DPUs working uh, as much as possible. So um, let me just show you a bit what it looks like on uh, some profiling measurement that we have. So, um, so there are many dependencies. So if we look there, we've got the, the stage get read. Uh, which has a dependency with the dispatch. So each time the get read finishes, the dispatch started after it, uh, like that. So we have dependency like that, and we have also some dependencies on the resources because we do not have uh, uh, like infinite um, uh, memory, like legacy memory on the system. So at some point, uh, get reads can continue, but not the dispatch because of some buffer dependency. But that's not the point. And uh, at some point, all the DPU start. It's just right there. That's the starting part of the, the DPU uh, execution. And once uh, all the ranks uh, has finished the first iteration, right there, some, yeah, somewhere around here, We've got this uh, dispatch that is again uh, starting because of some dependency, and we have the first accumulation and the first uh, process read on this first iteration, and it goes like that with this uh, the end of the second iteration, and uh, all the DPU like that are working uh, as uh, as much as possible, and uh, at the same time we got our uh, x86 processor running some other task to do the volume calling at the same time. So everything is pipeline like that to be as efficient as possible, which allows us to, to get the performances we've got, uh, which are pretty uh, nice uh, with the DPU. And we expect uh, even better with the, the future version. Maybe, Romain, can you just uh, precise to everyone uh, what is a rank? Because you, you show like many ranks, just to... OK, yeah. So uh, maybe I will go back a bit to have just something. So. If you look at um, a DIM module, so what uh, the, the DIM module is what we've put in the server with the DRAM chip on it, you've got uh, eight chips on on each side of the of the DIM module, and one rank one rank is uh, something very uh, physical. It's just one side, so it's the eight chip that will be targeted by the CPU when it's doing a transfer, and so that's very important. Uh, it's, it's an hardware uh, thing, and but it's it's always on our mind because to get the, the best performances, we need to target always the, the rank to have uh, efficient transfer. So that's why that's why we are looking always at a rank and not uh, a DPU uh, on its own. Thank you. Okay, um, I think I'm, I'm done with uh, UPVC. Uh, so I will 
let uh, Julian do, do the second use cases. Um, I'm going to stop sharing for you to share. Yeah. Uh, OK, so um, Romaric has presented the first uh, use case <coughs> on genomics. Um, now I'm going to present a different use case on analytics, uh, which is index search. So first of all, um, what is uh, what we call index search? Um, so an index search engine um, tries to identify some items from a database, um, and it tries to do so by using some keywords from the user. Um, so typical examples are looking for web pages um, or looking for uh, some specific keywords in text documents. Or, for example, when you are searching for a particular product uh, on an e-commerce website. Um, <clears throat> so those engines, commercial engines that uh, do this search, like Google Search, for example, or Elasticsearch and Algolia, uh, typically they would have to process billions of queries daily. Uh, which means that there is a challenge uh, for this application in terms of uh, both capacity and performance. Um, therefore, I mean, we, we want to see like uh, what kind of benefits uh, PIM can bring to this application. And that's the purpose of this work. Yeah, so as I said, um, uh, in this work, the idea was to evaluate, uh, I mean, how to uh, have some benefit, I mean, uh, in terms of latency and throughput for index search application using PIM architecture. And we have done this uh, through a partnership with, uh, uh, with a customer, uh, which is a global US-based search engine leader. And what this customer has shared with us is uh, provided us with uh, one of their worst case scenario. Uh, so they have this uh, document database uh, with over 12, 12 million uh, text documents. Uh, and uh, the total size of the index for this uh, database is about 120 gigabytes. And they have a specific uh, uh, query of five words, uh, which I know is uh, their worst case. And they wanted to see, OK, uh, they have the, the, the time. Uh, they know how much time they can get this query. Uh, on their legacy x86 uh, uh, implementation, and they wanted us to uh, evaluate how much we can get uh, using the, the PIM. Um, so in this presentation, I will uh, talk a little bit about the algorithm, how we implemented that, and the result. But just to give a little bit uh, uh, key points first on the performance, uh, we have found that this uh, the PIM can pretty much accelerate this application both in terms of uh, latency and throughput. Um, so in terms of latency, um, we estimate like about two orders of magnitude better latency. Uh, and uh, for throughput, it goes between 5 and 11 uh, uh, more requests per second. OK, so the search algorithm. So uh, the idea is that we want to scan uh, an index database of documents, find some sequences of words, um, so here we are only looking at um, exact queries. So we want to find exact match of a sequence of words. We are not looking at uh, finding related documents or something like uh, scoring the, the different results. We are just looking for exact matches and listing, listing them. And the database uh, is organized by words. It, it means that um, we'll get the same data structure for each word. Uh, I will detail it uh, in the SQL. Uh, and uh, so for each word, this database will help us quickly find uh, where this word is, in which document, and in which position. So this word has each word has a, has a list of uh, uh, documents, which uh, we actually store document IDs, which we call the IDs. And this is followed by the list of uh, position in that particular document. Now, this database, obviously, uh, this kind of the, the, the kind of databases where we want to run this, uh, they can be very huge. So we have to uh, make sure that uh, the, the, the space of, uh, taken by this that memory space taken by this database is not too huge. So it's a binary format where we uh, first try to only encode the differential values. Uh, and second thing is we have a specific encoding where each byte is actually uh, uh, having only seven bits 
of actual data and one bit which is used as a continue flag to say, do I need one more byte or not to encode this particular value? Okay, so on this slide, uh, it's just an overview, a quick overview of uh, the architecture of this application, how we do uh, data fragmentation and the distribution over the PIM architecture. Uh, so to take the best benefits of the, the, the PIM, um, and from what Romaric has shown also about the architecture, uh, we have to parallelize this search over the broadest number of processing units. So typically we'll have a very large number of processing units. So we have to, we have this big database, we have to fragment it uh, and distribute those fragments uh, over the different units so that when we go for the search, uh, there will be mass parallelization of this search uh, over different fragments. So on this slide, um, this slide is just to show the, the database model. Uh, so I already talk a little bit about it, but uh, here this is the illustration. So uh, there are same data structure for each word, right? And uh, for one word, uh, you will have uh, different segments, which are actually only a group of documents. And uh, you have a fast uh, way of going through these uh, document IDs uh, through uh, next uh, DID going from one segment to the next. And in each, each segment, you have a list of uh, DIDs which are encoded uh, as a, a differential value, as we say. So this is why you, you see the delta and the list of positions. So first the length uh, in terms of number of bytes uh, that you need to encode this position and, and then the uh, differential value for the position. Okay, so a little bit more on the uh, data fragmentation. Um, so the, the way we, we create one fragment is by assigning a specific interval of uh, document IDs uh, to this particular fragment. Uh, the fragment will actually have the information for every word in the vocab vocab vocabulary, sorry, uh, but it will be associated only with a specific subset of uh, document IDs. Uh, so the why we do it this way is because then each PIM unit will contribute to every single search. So if you want to search for a particular word, um, you will send that request to every PIM unit and every PIM unit will uh, search for this word in the particular uh, subset of document IDs which is responsible for. Um, now, um, as Romaric explained also in the architecture part, um, we need to use uh, threads on each PIM unit so that we make sure that the performance is, uh, is good and the pipeline is full. So we are not going to assign only one fragment per PIM unit, but we are going to uh, um, assign 16 fragments uh, one and, and have 16 threads working in parallel in each unit. Okay, so. Uh, this storage also is persistent during the application lifecycle. So it means um, we have to load these fragments to the uh, MRAM um, only once, and then uh, you can ask as many queries as you want. Okay. Um, and um, obviously, these fragments they need to be relatively uh, small in size because we have only 64 megabits per PIM unit available to store them. And then, uh, <clears throat> since we have uh, 16 tasklets working in parallel, <clears throat> each tasklet <clears throat> will manage uh, its own fragment and, and, and work in parallel, and, uh, and the search will be... Uh, so there will be, for one search, uh, number of DPU times 16 uh, uh, threads working in parallel to, to find the word in different uh, document IDs. Okay, so... Um, now the question is as well, so if we have this uh, database that uh, enables us to find quickly one word in different documents, and but what we want to find is to find a particular query, so uh, consecutive words. Um, so without going into many details, the algorithm we use to do that has two uh, main steps. One is the document selection, so first you we'll look for the next document IDs where all the words from the query are present. 
Uh, so typically, this is uh, something where we keep on the max uh, document ID over the, all, all the worlds, and we know this is the first uh, IDs where we have we can possibly find all the words and we go on like this until we find one machine document. When this is done, we go to the word alignment step where we do a similar process over the positions until we find or not uh, the correct alignment of words. So if we find so, we store it and we have this uh, collection of results that will be uh, sent back to the host at the end of the application. And this process obviously is um, uh, repeated un until all documents have been looked into. Um, so this process is what each uh, tasklet will be running on its own fragment. Okay, so on its own set of uh, document IDs. So on this slide, we see the, the view from the host. Um, so on the host side, uh, there are essentially three steps. Uh, the first one being the setup. Uh, where we have to broadcast the request over every uh, PIM unit. Um, and then there is a waiting part where every uh, thread is working in parallel, doing the search in parallel. Then the collection part where we do this copy from the uh, PIM units back to the host. Uh, and um, when we talk about the latency of those requests, we have to addition um, the three times for these steps. And uh, one important part here is that um, we have to wait uh, for the, the last PIM unit to finish. Uh, so what will actually matter is the maximum time for uh, over the PIM units to process uh, the query. So it means that load balancing is kind of critical in, in that application. Okay, so <clears throat> now I'm going to talk about the results. <clears throat> so for that query that uh, the commercial partner has uh, shared with us. So to do that experiment, we uh, did it using uh, uh, 2,541 2, PIM units. <clears throat> um, and um, what we measure is a setup time of uh, 0 0.05 milliseconds, a collection time of 0.5 milliseconds, and the maximum uh, around 5.1 milliseconds for the, the uh, search on every DPU. Uh, so in total, this gives a, a latency of about 5.7 milliseconds, and um, we can uh, estimate the throughput from that as being uh, one, one, 175 requests per second. So now to give as a, as a comparison to the reference from the, the customer uh, and the x86 implementation, uh, so they were using 12 threads uh, on a machine with two Xeon processors, and uh, oops, sorry. And um, what they reported is that they find a latency of about 200 uh, milliseconds and the throughput of uh, 60 requests per second. Um, so we can see that the, the PIM actually accelerates, uh, uh, I mean, the request, the latency is uh, much better. And we also get uh, more throughput. And I will talk a little bit more about it, but. I think throughput we can um, uh, improve further by doing uh, some uh, more optimization. Okay, so this is a, a view of the uh, profiling tool, like Romaric showed in the um, previous um, section. Um, and uh, what we see is that uh, in, in green, we have uh, the setup uh, for, for sending the request. In blue, this is the execution over the, the DPUs. And in purple, this is the part where we do the collection of the results sent back to the host. Um, so one point, obviously, the, the, the latency of this request, it finishes here, right? But we see that um, some DPUs are actually uh, being idle for a quite uh, non-negligible amount of time there because load balancing is not uh, perfect. Uh, so one thing we could do here is that if we can send batch of requests request to DPUs instead of one request at a time, uh, then this DPU here could start uh, processing a new request instead of being idle uh, till the end of this request. So that, would, that, that has potential for getting much better throughput. Latency will not improve, but at least throughput would improve. Okay, so. <clears throat> I talked about the performance we measure, but um, 
in the same way that uh, Remy discussed about the <clears throat> UPVC application, uh, we can uh, foresee uh, what how the performance can even improve further with next generation of uh, the platform that uh, uh, are in the pipeline. Uh, and uh, that's where we can estimate that the throughput can go. So if you look at the uh, current result, we have the throughput that is about uh, 3x uh, from the reference we got. Uh, when we increase the frequency, and we know that increasing the frequency will uh, linearly improve the, the, the performance, so we can go up to 5x. And uh, <clears throat> we estimate that uh, even uh, when we have much more DPUs and uh, with super scalar implementation, that could go up to 11x uh, better throughput. Um, and obviously, uh, energy gain and TCO uh, will also be better uh, as we uh, improve the platform. Maybe one mention here. So sorry, uh, Julien, just one yeah. mention to say that there are also room in terms of progression purely on the software side by implementing those optimization you talked about. Uh, there is this one that you, you mentioned, and there are even others in terms of balancing of DPUs and et cetera, which can also be an increase if I if I'm, I remember well about 30 to 40 percent better by just spending more time on the code. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now uh, I'm going to uh, show a short demo uh, just to give you a feel of uh, what we did for this application. Um, it's not going to be on the on the same request, but we have also evaluated that application on um, using the Wikipedia dataset, uh, and we do string search over that. Um, so there are about uh, 20 million files, a bit more than that, uh, which corresponds to uh, 240 gigabytes of text files. Uh, and the index size is not that big, uh, but it's about uh, four, four gigabytes. Um, so what I will show here is that, so, oh, okay, so first we have created that index, which is fragmented. And in this demo, we'll use a machine which has uh, 640 DPUs running at 267 megahertz. Okay, so let me start sharing. Okay, so I have a specific uh, uh, I have a specific uh, repository there where I have put the demos. Um, so what do we have here? I have a files directory, which actually contain the set of files uh, for Wikipedia, which we have downloaded. Uh, so if I do list that, we can see there are different files. Uh, so. I can open one just to see what's in there. Okay, so it's a, a Wikipedia file. There are some markers also there that the parser has to um, ignore, but it's basically text and we can look for string into that. Uh, so there are many, many uh, files in different recursive directory. If we look there, there are, oh, sorry. Uh, there are many uh, different directories with a lot of, uh, files so it's quite big okay um now we have created the index for that as i said so creating the index we have a specific uh, program which is also multi-threaded to do that um so it's taking a, a bit of time right so i have done it before uh, it may take about uh, two three hours to do uh, and it will generate like this index okay which is uh, basically containing one file for each DPU. So as I said, on this system, I have uh, 640 DPU. So I will have 640 binary file. Uh, and this, this binary file will contain uh, the fragments for each of the 16 tax sets for one DPU. Uh, and um, we have a main program in Python, uh, which will be responsible to uh, send this data, so this uh, uh, index over the DPUs, start the DPUs, run the program. So uh, we have a DPU task program, which uh, implements what I've shown in the slide, like this uh, search for consecutive words. Um, and that's it. So maybe, okay, I have this 
Uh, I have this demo script, uh, which will run the program. So let's, so actually I have already started it um, over here. So the reason is um, uh, loading the M1 is uh, taking like two or three minutes. So I wanted to spare you the, the time for that. Uh, as said before, in this application, loading the M1 would be something you do once and then you can uh, ask more queries. So in that script, just show like on the Wikipedia, we just have like a simple, uh, you know, um, uh, inputs where we give max five words and we can see output the results that we see uh, from, from the match in the, in the Wikipedia set. So let's try uh, some query like, um, I don't know. Um, Okay, so if we do that, like uh, something related to that conference, right? We find one uh, document uh, with one match. Um, so we can try something else. Maybe I think this one will give no result at all. Yeah, this one gives no results. Uh, we can try something like. Um, <clears throat> maybe much more, uh, we, we expect more wizard, like maybe a fam famous movie or Lord of the Rings. Uh, yeah, and yeah, we, so the, the, the program doesn't display everything. It tells us like, okay, there are 740 matches and it shows some of them. So uh, with the documents, yeah, for example, we see, okay, Lord of the Ring, I, I find it in the documents for Bilbo Baggins. Um, and that's pretty much it, right? We can look for something even more common and we have much more results, like around 6,000. <clears> so we can see it's pretty fast, right? It's like um, interactive and uh, we don't wait that much. And it's only using 640 DPUs, so it's uh, actually not even um, the maximum performance we, we can get. Okay, so that's it for, for this demo. Um, let me switch back to the presentation. Uh, okay. <clears throat> um, and I just have one last slide. Um, so to conclude a bit about uh, the application we have seen like UPVC and uh, index search, and uh, there are all, as well other applications uh, we have uh, worked on. And so there are, I wanted to, to share uh, some background about what we think uh, are the characteristics uh, for application, which would be a good fit <coughs> for this uh, PIM architecture, right? Uh, so <coughs> most of the facts are quite obvious, I would say, but I think it's pretty good to uh, recall them. Um, so one thing is um, this application needs to be massively data parallel because there are many DPUs working in parallel. That's how we get the acceleration. And each uh, will handle a, a pretty small fraction of the data. So it has to be fine grained. Um, <clears throat> also because each DPU <clears throat> only has a 64 megabit of uh, DRAM accessible. Um, DPU cannot communicate between each other, <clears throat> sorry. So <clears throat> task parallelism uh, will not be the best fit here, right? Uh, that's what we mean because <clears throat> you can have task parallelism, but um, it will involve more orchestration time. Um, so you will obviously get uh, less benefit. Um, so little synchronization and data dependencies is also uh, an important point. <clears throat> As I said, there is no communication through DPUs. This has to go through the host, so it will uh, take more time. Um, so we have examples of application where we can accelerate uh, quite a lot, even if there are dependencies. But if this is the case for your application, uh, most of the time uh, it will you will get a better benefit by uh, redesigning the algorithm uh, to make sure that this dependency is minimized. Um, and last point I would say is that um, PIM is most fitted for data intensive application because you want to leverage the large bandwidth and fast, fast access for, of the DPU to the DRAM. 
Um, and therefore, it's less relevant for a computation intensive application where you are uh, you have little data and uh, a lot of compute. Okay, and that's conclude that concludes my presentation. So um, if there are any questions, uh, let me know. Uh, I can try to answer. Yeah, let's give it one minute to see if questions come. Sure. Julien, we'll stay on your presentation for, for the conclusion. Okay, sure. All right, I see no question, but if there are any, we will still do a last one uh, after the conclusion. So let's let's move on and we already exceeded my predicted two hours uh, runtime, but it should be uh, it should be short from now. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. All right, so what I want to, to say in, um, in for the future, a question was asked uh, in, in the line of this. Um, of course, we promote a lot of cooperation with universities uh, or institutions around the world. Um, and for that, we also uh, provide preferable, or I would say privileged access to our cloud and our PIM data center. So this is um, something that we do, as you can see, the two use, ca use cases that we exposed is only part of the whole picture. There are many topics that are being uh, at the moment investigated uh, by many teams. So of course, genomics has very favorable, um, I would say challenges that the PIM can address, uh, but it's not the only one. As you can see, it can go from image processing to database to even machine learning and security is also a very important thing that PIM uh, can uh, propose some uh, very interesting innovation um, and so on. So as you can see, it's not just two uh, possible areas, but many more uh, where all the conditions that we uh, just showed, that Julian shown as a, as a good application for PIM, uh, then it can, be, um, it can be useful there. So next slide. Today, a good way to start if you were interested in everything that we showed today and you, you think that uh, it could be worth uh, your time to look into it and see how you can maybe uh, port an algorithm on PIM. Well, the, the, I would say the, the beginning of everything is probably in the SDK. You will find there a very thorough documentation uh, and you can find, of course, a simulator as uh, Romaric showed. And everything of the first part of this presentation uh, will be familiar to you now that you have a little bit uh, uh, of a knowledge of how it works to, to code simple things with PIM. But basically, it's not more complicated than that. So uh, usually, we, what we experience is in a, in a day or two of um, working around, people can get pretty smooth with, uh, with the SDK and programming. So here's the link. You can look into that uh, and download it on your on your computer. Uh, the other thing to look into is the GitHub, where you will find, of course, all those use cases that you saw today, but even the simpler one and the checksum and others uh, that can ins also inspire you of how those programs were made uh, and how they run. And it will be, I would say, instructive in your uh, journey of understanding the, the PIN. OK? Next slide. So after that, once I would say you've, um, you've looked into those, uh, those online resources, uh, we also have, of course, uh, the ability to provide training to, to people uh, interested in, in launching a project. With PIM, it's based a lot on what you've already saw uh, today, but it extended to we go into more details with functions specific to the SDK. Uh, and so on. So this is, I would say, useful for anyone that really is uh, anticipating um, a lot of work and, uh, and a lot of maybe uh, engineers to work on the on such a such a program. Of course, with that, we provide all the tech support needed. With Julia here dedicated to this, uh, but also the whole team is here to answer questions that uh, developers or researcher, researchers uh, may have as they program on PIM. 
So our data center today is in uh, Grenoble in France, where we're located. Uh, it, so it works today that you have to book ahead of time uh, so that's because it's a, it's a shared resource, right? So every team around the world uh, are sharing those, those servers that we put uh, at disposal. So there is a little bit of organization to have here, but it's pretty smooth so far. Uh, so don't hesitate to contact me if this is something that interests you as a, as a first step. Next slide. So for those that would like to uh, go further from this, like more than just the data center shared with other uh, teams, there's also the possibility to have your own server. Uh, we can provide the full server or we'd like also uh, even more to just provide the teams. Uh, and then you make the server uh, on your side. And for that, we also provide an installation package just to make sure that it goes smoothly uh, to set up. And then you are uh, all set to go and you can run your applications in your own server. So today we support one particular server just to make sure that there is no uh, problem and also because uh, using the PIM deems require a BIOS modification as of today. Uh, this will probably change in a year to come where it will possibly not need any BIOS modification, but because today it does, uh, it is linked to the system. And today it's an Intel server uh, with such reference that is required to run uh, with the PIM. So this is basically, I would say, uh, if you need uh, a server on your side, and this is something that we already do with some customers and labs. Uh, and, and as you can see, it can reach up to 20 PIM DIMMs, which is 2,560 DPUs. Uh, so that should be the case for some months until we reach maybe the Ice Lake platform, and then we go to over 3,500. Um, and in terms of frequency, today we're at 350 megahertz, like I said, in two months, 450 megahertz, and at the end of the year, hopefully about 600. Next slide. This is uh, basically the end. Uh, we uh, maybe exceeded of about 10 minutes, but that should be okay. Uh, I hope today you understood the principle of PIM. You saw how um, it's relatively, I would say, relatively easy to program with PIM and, and uh, get something done pretty quickly. If you have a, some command of C, uh, that shouldn't be too much of a challenge. And I hope you saw how it translated into real life application uh, in genomics or in analytics. And if it inspires you uh, with your own application, then don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, we can, of course, uh, provide some advices or give, us, uh, give you your, some opinion about what we think uh, in the particular use case you want to use. For that, don't hesitate. I have put my email here, uh, rcimadomo at upmem.com. And, uh, and then we can discuss in further detail your either research project or even maybe commercial project. Uh, and we'll be very happy to discuss it with you. So now maybe we can take the last uh, questions you may have, uh, and then we will call it uh, the morning. So do you guys have any questions? By the way, there's the opportunity to give you uh, the ability to speak. So if you want, you can raise your hand or something like this, and we can just also uh, let you speak and ask your question directly. Slides should be available, yes. Um, so I don't know how it works with the high peak. This whole session was recorded. Uh, maybe I should have warned you at the beginning. Not too late, no, you are recorded in your questions. <laughs> so yeah, it, it should be available one way or the other. Uh, and for that, maybe um, it's better to look with the high peak uh, database or the way that they're going to broadcast those uh, information. But if anything, if you want, those slides and others, you can also contact me and I will, um, I will make sure that you have all the information you need.
So today I will answer this question and if maybe uh, my, my colleagues want to, to join on me on this. Uh, basically the accelerator that we uh, produce today is a general accelerator, meaning that it is not specialized in doing a particular task uh, or calculation. So you can basically imagine any type of code, anything that C will run, this, the PIM will run. Uh, obviously, like uh, Julian showed, there are some specificities that uh, you should look into in your application so that it's really taking the best of the architecture, mostly prioritization and so on. Uh, but yeah, basically the, the, the DPU is a, is a general, I would say, risk processor. And yeah, in that sense, uh, a lot can be done. Most of instructions that are common to processors are also available in DPU uh, with one instruction per cycle. Uh, so here, yeah, it's uh, basically open to all imaginations. Uh, if my calling was to complete anything, um, that should be. Yeah, um, sure. Of course, yes, the, the accelerator is um, okay, is general purpose, so you can do whatever you want. Uh, and you need still to be aware of where the accelerator is good. So, of course, the application needs to, to stay in, in the good area where we have some uh, good improvement, like the massive parallelism and things like that. Um, for the question on the ESA, uh, it's a proprietary ISA, it's uh, a risk ISA, but uh, still uh, at that point it's a pro proprietary one. You, you can find information about it in the documentation on our website on sdk.mem.com. Okay, I'll give it one more minute, um, and then we will uh, we'll say goodbye. Okay, seems there, there are no more questions coming. Anyway, uh, do not hesitate to, to send your questions directly to me uh, or to, the, to anyone in the company. We'll be very happy to, to address them directly. And I guess that's all for today. Thank you very much for your participation and coming here and listen to us this morning. Thank you to our speakers, to Romaric and uh, and Julien for this uh, presentation. Thank you, and, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Hope to hear from you soon and have a good day and a good uh, conference. Bye bye. Bye.